Luke chapter 7, we'll continue in verses 36 through 50. I appreciate Pastor Brian stepping in last Sunday, hearing from that faithful, godly brother. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, with a sermon focused on rekindling a love for God. I've mentioned to you before that I'm originally from Illinois. There are just a few things that I still miss about living in the Midwest. First of which is the small town charm, where everyone knows everyone, you run into everyone at the store. I get really excited when I run into one of you at Publix, because I was just used to running into that all the time. You might think I'm overzealous, but just because of that background there. I also miss the four seasons. Here we have two seasons, hot and hotter, <laughs> right? So fall is my favorite season when the leaves change. And usually when fall comes around, the third thing I miss is a bonfire outside. If you've ever been up anywhere north, when fall starts to come around, the leaves start to change, the cool, crisp air starts to come through, a little chill rushes down your spine. So more often than not, what we would do is go and start a fire outside. Or even during winter months, as the snow is falling outside the window pane, you turn and strike up the fire on the indoor fireplace. There's something about those flames that draw you into it to experience the warmth and the comfort and the life and the vibrancy that it brings. You know, the fire itself begins with just one little spark or one little match. And it grows and it feeds and it enlarges itself. But if it's not continually putting more wood or more gas on that fire, it'll go out. It'll start to dwindle over time to where it's just a few embers burning slowly. You know, it truly is a perfect picture of life for those who are professing Christians. When you come to know Jesus Christ by faith, this spark is ignited in you and you are on fire. You are devouring the scriptures. You are serving every opportunity that you get. You are singing songs in your car on the way to work. You are witnessing to anyone and everyone who could even possibly listen and you're looking around wondering, why? why isn't everyone else this excited about the gospel, this excited about the Bible and about Christianity? Because what tends to happen is over the years, the cares and the responsibilities of life begin to weigh a little more heavily on you. And that which was once a raging fire of passions and desires tends to go to a more dimly lit fading within you. And that same gospel, which was once exhilarating and exciting, is now repetitive and finds commonplace in your life. And when that tends to happen, you can tend to feel like you're running low in a love for God. That you're almost running on empty. You're running more on duty and obligation. I know I'm supposed to do this. I don't have to do this, so I will do it. And you run more on that than more running more on delight and worship and the opportunity you have. So how do you avoid this type of situation from happening? Or maybe you're here this morning, and this is where you're at. You once had this vibrant love and affection for Christ, but it's over the years, as cares and responsibilities have come in, it's grown dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, where it's still there, but much more distant. The question is, how do you rekindle a love for God? Where does a love from, for Christ, where does it come from? Well, Luke's account this morning is going to answer these questions for us. And this morning, Jesus is going to talk about these things, and he's going to address the key to loving God is understanding, first and foremost, that you have been forgiven. You see, the more you know forgiveness, the greater your love will be for the one who forgave you. And this morning, this important principle will be illustrated through two different characters in our text. We'll see a selfless woman and a self-righteous man. Let's first look at this selfless woman in verses 36 through 38. Luke writes, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her 
tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. A picture of a selfless, sacrificial woman. So we enter into this first character in this first part of our text and find Jesus invited to the home of this Pharisee. We're not given a name yet, it comes later on, but we don't exactly know why. Why is Jesus invited to this Pharisee's home for this meal? We can likely presume is that everything the Pharisees did was to test Jesus, to get him to trip up, to examine him closely, to see is this truly a prophet of God? And so having this this miracle man at his house for this meal would give greater insight into who this man is and whether he's a fraud or not. And you see, back in this time and culture, life was lived open to the public. It wasn't private behind closed doors. Homes back then had an open floor plan. And this is not like HGTV open floor plan. This is like open to the exteriors, like exterior window openings, exterior roof openings, so that ventilation could come through at every angle because air conditioning, believe it or not, wasn't there yet. So along with this, these types of meals were held in an open courtyard, and they were more of a block party for the whole neighborhood to come and participate and to watch and see who this teacher is. And so it's not strange that we find here a random woman who's coming to this house, but what's strange and out of the ordinary is not her presence, but her actions. And so verse 37, Luke describes her very graciously as a sinner in the city. Very kind of you, Luke, to do that. But it's important because it's going to be brought up several times of this description, this label placed on this woman throughout of our text. And the nature of her sin, which is more publicly known, lends itself to possibly be that of adultery or that of harlotry. But Luke doesn't actually classify her sin because the truth is, the type of sin matters not to Jesus in our text this morning. But as we see in verse 37, that when this woman found out that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, that she went home and got an alabaster flask of oil, or you can think of it as expensive perfume. So we see these hints from verse 37 that this action wasn't irrational, it was actually premeditated. That she knew the savior of her soul was near in the city and at this man's home. And so she desired to extend her gratitude, extend an aspect of worship by giving and expressing her gratitude through the pouring of this expensive perfume on her Savior. She went home, grabbed it, no doubt hustling to get back to the party at that time. And when she arrives, pushes her way towards the front to see with her own eyes the Savior of her soul. God in the flesh, in her Midst. No doubt we see from the text this description by Luke that she's overcome with emotions. And we can understand why, right? She's found the, the one who has loved and purchased her soul from a life of immorality and of sin. And as tears welled up in her eyes, they were falling out of her like an uncontrollable mess, going all over Jesus' feet. She begins worshiping him at his feet. Now, meals back then were, in this culture, were eaten not by sitting down like you and I typically do, but they were more done reclining forward. Because of the dirtiness and uncleanliness of the feet, the feet would have been furthest away from the table. They might have been lying or with an elbow on a pillow as they sat forward and leaned forward, reclining towards the table to begin eating. So we get this picture, how is Jesus' feet open and exposed to this woman? Well, they're behind him and access to her. And so as she's behind Jesus, her, her tears are overcome with emotion and they've been falling on his feet and, and overcome with emotion of her Savior. This is God who has saved her. She bends down to begin wiping his feet, letting down her hair with, and wiping it with her hair. You know, the form of which she's doing here is wildly inappropriate for the culture at her time because she was touching and wiping and washing his feet with her tears as... She begins to let down her hair to wipe them up. And for a woman back in this culture to let down her hair would be immodest. For loose hair meant loose morals. And the washing of the feet was only done by the lowest servants and slaves in the household. To do that, any reputation this woman had would have been out the window. It was done. She was in the most humiliating of circumstances. Her hair was down. She was at someone's feet washing them with her hair. But she didn't care. She didn't at least care what other people think. She only 
cared about her Savior who was here. It didn't matter what it looked like to others. She knows who this man is. She knows the message of salvation which he has brought, which has saved her from a life of wickedness. She is the perfect example of a new believer who's tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that there is forgiveness for sins, and it radically changes their life. It doesn't matter what people think. It only matters what God thinks and living a life of sacrificial, selfless worship and service to Him. Her love is on fire. Her, her commitment is unmatched and unwavering. She doesn't do this out of false humility to be seen by others. She does this not out of a duty, but as a delight to worship the one who saved her. Because as we sang previously, he's worthy of all of her praise. This, dear ones, is the first character that Luke introduces to us, this selfless but sinful woman. Now Luke's going to give us a second character who's going to be compared and contrasted the rest of the way, a self-righteous man. Look at verses 39 through 50. Well, I'll read a little bit, explain it as we go because it's a little bit longer. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him, for she is a sinner. Initially, verse 39, we get one verse into this new character and see that his response and reaction to Jesus is wildly different than that of this woman. Where this Pharisee sits here composed and collected in his pride in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ while this woman is on her face in tears, her hair is down in brokenness and worship. While she worships at his feet, this Pharisee sits there judging Jesus. The Pharisee is not affected one bit by this woman's tears, by her desperate actions. They don't move him one bit. He knows her sin, and there's nothing that she can do to escape his judgment. And if Jesus is truly God, he would think the same way about her as he does. Truly, if Jesus knew who this woman was, he would not allow her to associate with him. For her promiscuity, for her public nature of her sin would be damaging, possibly ruining his reputation as a teacher of much respect. But you know what this Pharisee's doing in verse 39? He's revealing a mindset that many Christians, even in the church, can have. That public sins are much more heinous in God's eyes than secret, <coughs> private sins. In fact, the public nature of her sin in our day, you can liken it to that of homosexuality, or of being transgender, or a drug addict, or an alcoholic, that of public, grotesque nature seemingly to the public eye. But if you search through the scriptures, you'll find that God cares just as much about the secret sins of the heart as he does the public sins of the body. Because the truth is, the woman's not the only sinner in town, although it seems as such from this text so far. This Pharisee is also a sinner. But his sin of pride, of arrogance, of hard-heartedness, of judgmentalism is much more socially acceptable in his town just as it often is in the church today. But Proverbs 6 tells us some things that God hates. Verse 16 through 19, these six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. And throughout Jesus' life and ministry for just a few years, the Pharisees would break every single one of these things. You see, we can easily find ourselves like this Pharisee, so consumed and finger-pointing at those around us and in the world that have a greater sin than we do, so we feel a little bit better about ourselves. See, I'm not as bad as that person because, whoo, I'm not living how they are. I would never do that. I would never let my kid do that. But you see, dear ones, the standard of our holiness is not to be compared to those around us. It's only to be compared to Jesus Christ himself. And that's what this Pharisee is missing. And so instead of focusing the attention on himself, 
we can likewise also focus the attention so much on the sins of other in the church and in this world that we're less effective. In fact, so often the church can focus so much on the sin that exists in Satan's world to where they're ineffective in their own purity in the church. Dear ones, we, we, we must not be more concerned with the sin that exists in Satan's world instead of the sin that is socially accepted in Christ's church. Because let's not forget about what we're held responsible for. We're not held to be responsible to present Christ a pure world in the end, but we are held responsible to present him a spotless bride, the church, in the end. But too often what happens is we tend to isolate from those who have more public sins. And those who are more unnatural, just like this woman is treated as an outcast, she's the sinner in the town, nobody associates with her, she's an intruder, why is she here? We can so often be like this woman that gravitates more towards those who are like us over here and treats those who have more grotesque public sins as outcasts. But is this the response of Jesus to the woman in our text? Is this truly the heart of God towards those who have more public sins, that he excuses those sins which are more private? Because as I said, this woman was not the only sinner in the town. It just appears in our text that she's the only repentant sinner in the room because Jesus was sitting across the table from another sinner, but one that's filled with pride and self-righteousness that doesn't realize it. And Jesus knows this Pharisee's heart, and he's going to actually address him by name for the first time in verse 40. Look at that. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. Verse 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, the freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged See, Jesus refers to this Pharisee's name for the first time, I think showing that he's not the spiritual elite that he thinks he is, but he's just another one in God's created realm who's not living accordingly. You see, Simon doubted that Jesus was a prophet because Jesus couldn't see clearly that this woman was a sinner and he shouldn't associate with her. But Jesus is going to prove that not just that he saw the woman's heart, but that he also saw Simon's heart reclining across him at the table. So he tells Simon a parable, a parable which is a a fictional story with a spiritual meaning intended because a story is much less offensive than an open rebuke. And so the parable is simple that Jesus tells. Is someone more grateful who's forgiven 500 denarii or 50? A a, a denarius is one day's wage. So would somebody be more grateful if they were forgiven about two years worth of debt of earnings compared to one with just 50? You can think of it in our terms. You know, you'd be happy if, if the bank maybe forgave your car payment. That would be awesome, right? But how much more elated would you be if the bank said, you don't need to send anything more for your mortgage? What? You see, that much more grateful based on that which more forgiven. And so the truth of this story is crystal clear, which is why Simon, the Pharisee, doesn't miss it. But you see, while Simon judges rightly in this case of this parable, he he misjudged this woman because he saw her as she used to be as a sinner. She does not see him as Jesus sees her, as one who's been made new, who's been forgiven and is now in him. But Jesus actually doesn't wait for Simon to figure out the application. Okay, so what? Jesus gives it to him directly in verse 44. Then he turns to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Jesus poses an ironic question to Simon the Pharisee. Do you see this woman? You can just imagine his reaction. Of course I see her. She's the embarrassment of the party. 
How do you associate with her, right? Because he's seeing through with lenses of judgmentalness and condemnatory attitudes. But Jesus says, no, do you, don't see her in her sin. Do you see her in her worship? How she's treating me here. For this woman is giving Jesus the proper treatment as an honored guest in the household. Because what Luke alludes to now is that the typical customs of a guest and the culture were missed. They were intentionally overlooked. In fact, a student, if, if a teacher was coming in and a student was hosting him, there would be a kiss on the, on the forehand as a sign of respect. If there appears, there would be a kiss on the cheek. Jesus says, verse 45, this did not happen. Jesus did not receive this. Next, uh, when a guest entered, there would be some oil or perfume that would be poured on the forehead to sort of refresh and moisturize the face from the heat and the elements of the cracked skin. But verse 46, Jesus says he did not receive this either. You see, the very basics of hospitality in this culture were missing in this situation. It was not simply an oversight. You know, several years ago, I, I once visited North Carolina, and I witnessed for the first time what true Southern hospitality is really like. As soon as you enter into the home, your, your jacket's taken. You're offered a glass of the finest sweet tea or another beverage that you would like. You're directed to the nicest seat in the living room, and you are pelted with question after question about who you are, your life, your family, your job. They want nothing but to care for you as their honored guest. But Simon the Pharisee, to miss these basics of hospitality in their culture and customs, it was equivalent to not taking someone's coat when they come in, not offering them a glass to drink, pointing them to the card table that's set up in the side room and said, you can eat with the kids. That's the insult that was directed towards Jesus. It was disrespectful and deliberate inattention to the honored guest. And therefore, this woman, possibly what overcame her with emotion, she saw Jesus was not treated how he deserved to be treated. So she took over the role of the host in the house. But Jesus brings these up not to demean Simon the host, but to reveal the massive crack in his self-righteous armor. He's not so high and mighty as he thinks he is. But he, too, is a desperate sinner in need of saving. Which is why Jesus turns to the woman in verse 48 and says this. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. See, it's important to understand the, the flow of these events here. Because this woman came in already loving Jesus. It, it's not her works and her love that saved her here, but her faith previously, which did. But simply her actions of love and worship and devotion here shows that she was already converted before arriving at the scene that day. But she simply came to worship the God who saved her. The language of verse 48 communicates this as well. Jesus says, your sins have been forgiven. It's, it's a verb with a tense that indicates it was a past reaction and decision which carries in continued effects and into the future as well. Meaning this, she'd been forgiven in the past when she professed faith in Christ and repented of her sins. But that forgiveness extends to the present and continues to extend for the future forevermore. Her sins have been forgiven. They are forgiven now. They will forever be forgiven. And she will one day be forgiven for all of eternity. That's the language here. And her love is the fruit which was produced from a heart that had been born again by God. So then the question is raised, why did Jesus make this verbal declaration that her sins are forgiven? Why would he do this? Well, you see, it matters how this woman's been labeled in verse 37 by the town as a sinner. You'll notice she was labeled by Simon, emphasized, in fact, in verse 39, that she was a sinner. All the people knew her was the sinner. But in verses 48 and 50, Jesus gives a perfect picture of what judicial pardon looks like in the heavenly courts. He says, when you are forgiven, you are forgiven your debt of sin. You're declared righteous in a perfect standing before God, and you now have peace with him, and you can go in that peace. You'll notice that she wasn't welcome in Simon's household because she was a sinner, but it's because she was a sinner who recognized it that qualified her to be in God's household. Because God only has those sinners who know that they have broken his law. 
who know that they've failed him. And they cry out to him for forgiveness and mercy. Those repentant sinners are the only sinners whom he forgives. And so in verses 48 through 50, it's really a public, it's actually said for the room, for the town, for the community. You know her just as sinner. But forevermore, you need to know that she is my child. No longer just a sinner. She is a repentant sinner saved by grace. And her actions show that of a woman who knows she's been forgiven of so much and came to worship as an outflow from it. I want to connect a few of these dots. What does this mean for us today? How does this come into the fact of rekindling a love for God? I want to connect a few of these dots and we'll be done this morning. The first, I don't want you to miss it. Jesus forgives repentant sinners. These are the only kinds of sinners that he does truly forgive. Those who know that they've failed. And those who cry out to him for mercy. But he forgives everyone. Absolutely every individual who repents of their sins before him. It's a promise that he gives. You know, the two characters in this account couldn't be more different. One was of a, of a high social standing, the other was an outcast in the town. One was a host, the other was an intruder in the household. One was angry, judgmental, and the other was humble and gracious and thankful. One came to evaluate Jesus, the other came to worship him. But the greatest difference between these two characters in this text is that only one of them knew that God extended grace to sinners, and it was this woman. For she had repented of her sin, trusted in him by faith, and it was evidenced in her loving attitudes and actions that day. You know, it's perhaps most intriguing in this whole text, you can often miss it because this woman is elevated, and rightfully so, because of her faith and her witness and her worship. But Jesus actually uses this woman evangelistically to show Simon the Pharisee that he's a sinner. Because Jesus knows that repentance comes hardest for those who are self-righteous. You see, you don't value forgiveness unless you think you've done something wrong. You don't truly cherish the cross of Christ unless you think that you're a sinner in need of his saving. But there are so many in that world and this world as well who think that they're okay. Maybe that they're not perfect. You know, they've done some bad things. But they're a lot better than that person over there. Or they've done some good things, and that should be enough to balance out the scales in the end. But the scriptures teach that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There, there's none good. No, not one. And this woman knew this, which is why she was so grateful to have been forgiven that day, and why Jesus elevated her in this account as the exemplary character in this text. Secondly, along those lines, I want us to not miss that those who've been forgiven will respond in a love for Christ. It is once you've been saved that you will naturally outflow of the fruits, as we've talked about in previous weeks, of love and devotion and sacrifice and humility and selflessness for Christ. But the order of these things is most significant. It was not because of her love that she was saved, but because she'd been forgiven, that love overflowed from that knowledge of her forgiveness. First came her faith, then came her love. Because if you recall, we love because he first loved us. In fact, one writer put it this way, I found it helpful. The man whose sins are really cleansed away will always show by his ways that he loves the Savior who cleansed them. Which leads to one final consideration this morning. A love from Christ stems from knowing that your sins are forgiven. This is where true love for Christ flows from. The woman's love and devotion in our text flowed out of a heart that knew it had been forgiven of so much. Because you see, once you know that you've been forgiven of your sins and now you have peace with God, you'll abound for this love for the one who forgave and saved you. The rule in the text is very simple. The one who knows they've forgiven of much will love much more. Jesus emphasizes this in verse 47. It is the critical key of the whole passage. Where Jesus says, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Here it is. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. 
You see, there is a direct connection between the knowledge of our sinfulness and the greatness of God's forgiveness, which leads to how much we truly love Him. The more you know of your sin and how much you've been received of mercy and grace from Him when you deserve divine judgment, the more you will love the one who washed those sins away and cleared it. So if you don't love Christ greatly this morning, what do you do? You must go back to the heart of the gospel. If you're not loving greatly, the issue lies in your understanding of the basics of the gospel. If you don't love Christ, it's because you're not gripped by the truth that you've been set free from sin. You're no longer condemned. You have peace with Almighty God as accomplished through the blood of the cross. But you see, if you wish to love Christ more, which I think most everyone in here would say, yes, I want that. You have to go back to the gospel and sit there and dwell there until your love grows. Because the secret to loving Christ is not doing more yourself. It's sitting at the feet of Jesus, savoring what he's already done for you. That's where love grows. But you know what? If we're honest, we're, we're not so great at dwelling on things. We have an issue in our world today with thinking deeply about really anything. We're we're a society that scrolls, not a society that sits and dwells. We can obtain so much surface level information in a nanosecond, but it goes away just like that. And you see, sometimes we transfer that same retention to the truths of Scripture. Yeah, I read it, I got it, good, moving on. No, 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 no. You don't just get it and move on from God forgiving a sinner like you. You don't ever move on from that. And in fact, the more you sit there and savor the grace of God as displayed on the cross in forgiving your sins, the more you sit there, the more God's love will be poured out into your heart for him and for others. See, we've lost this skill of thinking deeply about the gospel. Sometimes we think we grow beyond the gospel. Yeah, that's the basics. I get it, okay? But but no, you never truly move beyond the one who took your place on that cross. Knowing that the full obligation of fulfilling righteousness and also accomplishing the penalty for your sins, that both of those have been paid if you're in Christ. You don't ever move past that. In fact, you would do well to never move beyond that. The greater maturity of those who are in Christ are those who more meditate on the gospel, on the truths of it. And then that shapes everything that they say and do. You understand also that when it comes to forgiveness, that that God cannot actually grant this forgiveness without taking on the debt of the one forgiven. Just like a bank, when if it forgives you, per se, of a car payment or a house payment, the dealership still has to get its money. The seller still has to be paid. So the bank takes on those deficits and absorbs them themselves. The same with Christ. God, God cannot just say, okay, you have a pass. Your sins are forgiven, they're wiped away because then he won't be a God who deals justly with sin. So he had to still take on the obligation of fulfilling the debt which he prescribed. For the punishment for sin is death. And so he took on that debt on his own, sending his own son to not just earn the righteousness that we were required to earn, but he absorbed the wrath of Almighty God for sin that we were supposed to absorb. He took all of it. And he gives us forgiveness freely. Dear ones, if you truly have experienced this, if you know of this forgiveness, you know the love that flows from knowing you have been forgiven. And in fact, if your love 
is dwindling for Christ. If you find yourself struggling to, you're operating more out of duty than out of delight. You're operating more out of obligation. I know I'm supposed to read, so I'll do it. I know I'm supposed to serve, so I'll do it. But you're missing that love and adoration. How do you gain that back? You go back to the gospel. You go back to saturating your mind with the sweetness of your Savior and what he's done for you. In fact, turn over to Romans 5 and we'll end here. Where does love come from? Love comes from God. And this love is poured out into our hearts, which is what Romans 5 tells us. Very first verse is what Jesus told that woman that day, go in peace. How could he do that? Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go down to verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Verses 8 and 9. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, these simplistic verses here, verse 1 and verses 8 and 9, are bookends of gospel pillars of truth. That you're justified by faith, you're forgiven and declared righteous by your faith and your faith alone, and it results in peace with God because the wrath of God was absorbed on Jesus Christ. On the other side, you say that all of this sending of Christ was done to demonstrate love for you, not when you were lovely, but when you were still in your sin, as a proactive demonstration of his love. But what's in the middle? The middle is what happens when you dwell on the outside too. When you know that you're justified by faith, you're forgiven, declared righteous, you have peace with God. When you know that God did this as a demonstration of his own kindness and his own love when we were unlovely. Verse 5, the Spirit pours out His love in our hearts. You, you see, we can't escape this without seeing the work of the Trinity of salvation. The Father sent, the Son accomplished, the Spirit, even in verse 5, applies this love to our hearts. All of this is what it was required to forgive you and to forgive me. And if we truly grasp that this morning, if we truly grasp that Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit did all of this to forgive me and all of what it took to accomplish my redemption, that should begin welling up a love for the one who forgave. You see, as we chew on these truths of the gospel, of how much that we've been forgiven, God's love is poured into your heart through the Spirit. Love comes from the source of love. It comes from God. We don't manufacture it. We don't muster it up. No, it only comes from the Spirit who pours it into our hearts as we sit and savor on the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that he's done truly for us. And then you know what happens. As you grow in this love for God, only naturally you're also going to grow in love for other people. And as you truly come to understand the significance of all that you've been forgiven by God when you're undeserving, all of a sudden you find yourself forgiving others a lot easier. Because who am I to not forgive you when I've been forgiven of so much? You see, dear ones, this is how the gospel changes not just your life and salvation, it continues to transform your life in sanctification and becoming more and more into the image of Christ and having the response that he did in this text this morning. Everything, everything comes back to the gospel. And we would be wise to also go back to it for this is where love was first shown to us. Let's pray. Father, we ask for your help to understand the great depths of your love for us. Father, that you would even do this when we are still sinners. 
Lord, I pray that you would continue to remove the distractions of this world, the distractions of Satan, who want us to move beyond this gospel so quickly, to think about anything else other than what you've done for us. Father, humble us this morning. Humble us beneath the cross of how great of a mercy you've given to us in comparison to how great of offense that we've given you. Father, I pray that you would open the eyes of every man, woman, and child this morning to see the truths of this gospel, that it would set them free because of the love that was displayed on Calvary. Father, rekindle a love in this church for you because of all that you've done for us. Help us to not move beyond the truths of your gospel. Thank you. Truly thank you for all that you've done for us through Jesus Christ. I pray that your spirit would pour out your love in our hearts that we might serve you greater and love you more and give you the praise that you rightfully deserve in this life. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.